We make things. We use our hands, minds, and machines to build, to fix, to improve. We're known as do-it-yourselfers, home improvement fans, fix-it fanatics, inventors. At our core, though, we're all makers. So let's jump in and make something. Hi, I'm Ron Hazelton. Welcome to the show, and what a show we've got today. First, we'll build some simple but very decorative wall panels that can transform just about any room. Then we'll construct a cat tree designed by an expert. It's a perfect palace for a feline friend. Next, I'll demonstrate a new tool that makes it unbelievably quick to change from drilling to driving. And finally, some timely tips on how to protect exterior wood fences, furniture, and accessories. Now, this is going to be fun. So grab a toolbox and let's get started. Well, today I'm headed to Davis, California to visit John and Marcy Nystrom. Well, it's obvious you guys have got something in mind here because you've already begun to paint. Why don't you kind of tell me what the effect is that you're going for here? Well, what we thought is we had the two colors here and we were going to put a wallpaper border up at the top there and then come with some framing on the wall that we could either paint a contrasting color or put wallpaper in as well. I'm thinking we might want to have one more element in here to separate the lower part of the wall from the upper part. And I suggest to Marcy and John that we add a strip of chair rail molding. Now, I find it can be a bit difficult to imagine how borders, moldings, and panels will look on a wall. So we decide to test our ideas first before we commit to paste and nails. First, Marcy and John temporarily tape up a portion of the wallpaper border they plan to use. Then we use wide masking tape to simulate the frame molding and chair rail. Well, what do you think? I like it. You Actually, it looks, looks good to me, too. Yeah. yeah? Now that we've agreed on where everything will go, we make measurements. Lower one is six and three quarters. Take down the tape and draw level and plumb or vertical lines showing where each piece of molding will go. All right, Marcy, start with the top mark. Uh, the edge of the level has got to go on the mark and you have to adjust the level up and down till this bubble is right between those two lines. Okay, that looks pretty good. Good. Okay. With all of our layout done, we turn our attention to the wallpaper border. The border is pre-pasted but Marcy yeah, prefers to use a paste that. activator rather than just water to guarantee a good bond. We apply the activator with a roller, then fold the pasted sides together, a process called booking. Leaving the pasted surfaces in contact with each other for a few minutes before application ensures the adhesive is thoroughly moistened and ready to go. Strips are unfolded, positioned on the wall, and pressed in place using a wallpaper squeegee. Marcy trims the ends using a wide putty knife and a very sharp knife. Meanwhile, I step outside and start setting up the saw for the molding we'll soon be cutting. Now what I've done here is make a work support system for the power miter saw. The reason is that we're going to be cutting several pieces of molding to exactly the same length. Now here's how it's going to work. First of all, let's say we want to cut a piece 42 inches long. I'd measure down from the blade 42 inches right here. And then take this piece of wood, which I call a stop block, put it right on that mark, clamp it in place. And for my molding, I just simply set it on here, slide the end of the molding up against the stop block, then go ahead and make my cut. Before we start cutting in earnest, though, we paint all of our molding. Pre-painting will save us a lot of tedious work later on. Okay, guys, that's great. So these are all the vertical pieces okay. cut. This is the chair rail. We're going to be putting this up next. It'll have to have miters on the end, too, where it goes to the inside corners. They'll be cut something like this. The, uh, there'll be one on each end. They'll go together like this and then give us a nice finished inside look. All the horizontal pieces of molding will be nailed into wall studs. Marcy locates and marks the studs using an electronic stud finder. 
Okay, now you see where the wall studs are. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, you, I'll tell you what, I'll put the first nail in right here, okay? You okay. Know when you're ready? A pneumatic nail gun is by far the fastest and easiest way to attach molding. And we don't have to worry about dents from a missed hammer blow. Air nailers can be rented or purchased. These days, you can find an entire system for under $150. Now, on this piece, we were able to catch three studs, John. Yes. On the verticals, there are no studs, so we're going to have to rely on some construction adhesive here. So I usually like to put just a dot every few inches on this. We'll still nail these vertical pieces, but just to keep them in place until the glue dries. The real holding power comes from the glue. Marcy wants a frame above the fireplace, in the center of which she plans to hang a circular mirror. Hey John, now these are corner blocks or plinth blocks. I'm going to set right here. Nice thing about these, John, is that they, you don't have to uh, cut any miters with these. So I'm going to lay this in. Okay, John, so just drop this in here now. With the molding up, we fill the nail holes with spackling. Our fingertips seem to work best for this. Well, that's... Why don't you stand down, John, let me know if it's in the center here. While John and I have been installing the molding, Marcy has been wallpapering the inside of the panels. She cuts the strips oversize and forces out any air bubbles with a squeegee, making sure the pattern matches and then trims off the excess with the sharp knife. Well, I gotta tell you, I think this adds a lot of dimension, a lot of detail, a lot of depth to this wall. I think so too. This is a project that I've thought about for a long time, but we would never have done it in this much detail by ourselves. You know what I love about this project? With a few strips of molding and a little wallpaper, you can take a room from plain to fancy, contemporary to traditional. Whatever look or feel you want to create, it's just that simple. Now let's talk about home improvement for pets. You know, those canaries, dogs, and cats that we all live with? Especially cats. You know, they can be really finicky. So I thought I'd try to design a cat tree that they would just love. And this is it right here. Now I'm going to have some pals coming over in a little while from the Humane Society to check this out. And I'll be here shortly, so we better get started. Now, some folks feel that the cat trees that you buy in stores don't really have stable bases. So, we're going to make ours with a very large and heavy base out of three-quarter inch plywood. Actually, two layers of it. And we're going to hook these together by first gluing them and then screwing them. So, I'm going to apply the glue. And since we've got such a large surface here, I'm going to roll it on with a paint roller. Take our second piece of plywood and just put this right on top. <coughs> okay. Then I drill some countersunk shank holes and drive in a few screws. Now that's a sturdy base. Now we're going to put a lip all the way around the outside here. Alrighty, well there's the base. Now we're going to start on the apartment complex. Now cats love cozy spaces that they can crawl into and out of. So we've designed kind of a two-story jungle gym here with plenty of entrances and exits. Now, for small to medium-sized cats, you want these holes to be about six inches in diameter. And so I've set up my compass here to be three inches, which is half of that. All right, we'll put the sharp part on the cross line here and draw ourselves a six-inch diameter circle. There we go. Now, we're going to be cutting this out with a jigsaw, so I'm going to drill a starter hole just inside the line that we drew. I'm going to drop that blade right into the starter hole and cut this circle out. Well, we've got all of our doorways cut. Those cats have got plenty of ways to get in and out. Now we're going to begin to construct the box, or should I say the kitty cottage. And we're going to be doing that by taking the sides, top and bottom, and putting them together with glue and nails. So let's start by putting some glue on the side right here. Well, 
Solar tower's finished. That'll sit right inside the base, just like that. Now, experts tell us that cats like to perch, scratch, and climb. I'd say we've got the perch taken care of. Now we're going to deal with the scratch and climb by covering all of this in carpet. So I've cut a piece here that drops right inside our base, as you can see, and we're going to hold this in place with some staples. And there we go. That carpet's not going to go anywhere. Next, we attach carpet to the side and top of the soon-to-be kitty high-rise. Well, our carpet's on, but those cats are going to have kind of a tough time getting to that door right now, aren't they? So we're going to have to cut a hole through the carpet. And the way to do that is to locate pretty much the center of the hole just by feel here. It's about right there, I would say. Then take the knife. We're going to go all the way through. We're going to cut out to the edge of the hole till the knife stops right there. And then make several sort of pie-shaped cuts like this, wedges, stopping at the edge of the hole, always going back to the center. I give each section a dab of construction adhesive, fold them around the edge of the opening, then staple them in place on the inside. Well, we've got a great place for our feline friends to curl up inside and perfect perch. Now we want to add a gymnastic element. I'm going to take four pieces of PVC pipe and create a frame that'll come up on all from all four corners right here. To attach that at the top, though, I've got to put something into this hollow pipe, a piece of dowel. I've mixed up some quick-setting epoxy, and I'll spread it on the inside of the pipe. There, yeah, that's good. And then we'll take a piece of our dowel and just slide this right inside. These dowels also provide a solid core to which we can attach a piece of sisal rope, a favorite scratching material. Ron? Hey, how are you? I'm good. How are this you? This is my friend Jean from the Humane Society. Nice to meet and you. And our buddies here, huh? Who have we got? We have in here, this is Tina and Turnip. Tina and Turnip. Hey, guys. These are two oh, little kittens found precious? in a dumpster. In a dumpster? Mm-hmm. Ten, You're ten kidding. days old. We've come up with a time-saving way to wrap the rope around the PVC, using my drill to spin the pipe while Jean guides the rope into place. Excellent. All right. So now we're going to go, okay, we're going to have it for Wait you. They're really impatient. They're anxious to try this out. Gene, could you hand me that last one there? Sure. We'll set this in place. And then if you can kind of align those marks up for me right there, I'll put the screws in. Finally, we join all our poles together by driving screws through the plastic pipe and into the wooden dowels I inserted earlier. Okay. Come on, little guys. Let's see what we Ooh, got for I you. Think, oh, look, look, look. She loves it. She loves it. Wow. Oh. <laughs> when it comes to cleaning products, there certainly is a lot to choose from these days. But let me ask you this. Have you ever thought of going green using a natural product? Well, just what is a natural product and how well do they work? Right now, there's no industry standard for natural cleaners. One company, though, Clorox, has set their own standard by making their Greenworks products from 99% natural materials, including coconut, lemon, and corn. How well do natural cleaners work? Well, I put them to the test. I tried out the all-purpose cleaner, the glass cleaner, the bathroom cleaner, and the concentrate. I put the all-purpose cleaner to work on countertops, cooktop spills, even the inside of the oven door. It seemed to work as well as most traditional cleaners I've used. There was very little odor, and the smells I did detect were not at all offensive. The brand Clorox is practically synonymous with bleach. However, there is no bleach in any of the Greenworks products, including the bathroom cleaner. It worked well on porcelain sinks, chrome plumbing fixtures, and the tile walls in the shower. The Greenworks glass cleaner starts out a bit sudsy, but clears up quickly, leaving a squeaky clean surface free from smears and smudges. The formula uses no ammonia or alcohol. For floors, I tried the concentrate. Now, I don't recommend waterborne cleaners for wood floors, but the solution did a good job on the entryway marble tile. The Greenworks cleaners contain no phosphorus and can be safely disposed of down the drain. 
So the next time you're choosing a cleaning product, think about going natural. It's good for your family and good for the environment. Now, if you're like me, you use your drill as much for driving as you do for drilling, especially if you're putting screws into hard material. Now, what that usually means is that you first have to load the drill bit. Drill a hole. Remove the drill. Put in a driver bit. And then drive in the screw. Now that's not so bad if you've only got to put in a couple of screws, but if you've got to drive a lot of them, well, it can be a real time waster. So I want to introduce you to a new tool. It's called the Twist Lock Drill and Drive System, and it can really save you a lot of time on this otherwise dual operation. With the Twist Lock System, you first insert a bit holder and drill bit into the chuck. Then drill the pilot hole. Here I'm also making a countersink in the same operation. Now, instead of removing the drill bit, I simply slip a driver bit holder over it, place a screw on the magnetized tip, and drive it in. Another version of this system uses this keyless chuck within a chuck. It accepts any standard round shaft drill. For drilling any pilot or clearance hole, and uses the same slip-on bit holder. So that's it, from drilling to driving with just a twist. Whether you've got a brand new fence like this one or a deck that's been around for years, it's important to seal or waterproof exterior wood. Why? Well, for one thing, wood soaks up water like this dried, compressed sponge. And as the wood dries out, it contracts. It's this continuous expanding and contracting as the wood gets wet, then dry, that causes it to crack, warp, and splinter. Also, ultraviolet rays from the sun break down wood cells and can deteriorate wood. And finally, believe it or not, Rainwater can actually wash the color out of certain woods like redwood and cedar in much the same way that I'm washing the coffee out of this sponge. So that's why you need to seal or waterproof exterior wood and keep it sealed. Fortunately, that's pretty easy to do these days because there's a new type of wood waterproofer out there. It can be applied to new pressure treated lumber as well as freshly cleaned damp lumber. Which means you can clean and seal your wood in the same day. Waterproofers can be brushed on or they can be applied with a garden sprayer. If sprayed on, it's best to follow up with a brushing just to work the sealer well into the wood. Now sealers or waterproofers can be clear or tinted like this one. As a matter of fact, there are so many tinted sealers available that you can create just about any kind of effect that you want. How often should you reseal? Well, here's a simple test that you can do splash some water on the wood. If it beads up like this, you have protection. If it soaks in, like this example, it's time to retreat. To view today's projects again, visit rondhazelton.com. Step-by-step home improvement tips when you need them. Let Ron show you how to do it yourself.